Yesterday's Prophecies for Today's World. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer, and he is in you, and you need not be afraid. And now, how Lindsay's Bible study, the book of John. We come to John chapter 3 tonight. Now I have to say this is my favorite chapter in the Bible. This is the chapter I was reading when I came to know Jesus Christ all alone on a tugboat. And so it's very special to me. But it should be special to everyone. I label this section here the purest gospel ever spoken. And I do believe that the gospel as Jesus presents it in John chapter 3 is the purest expression of the good news of what he came to do and what he offers to mankind. Beginning with John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Right away, this tells us some very important details. Nicodemus is uh, an interesting name. I don't know how who named him, because that's not a Jewish name. It's a Greek name. Nico means conqueror. Demas, conqueror of the people. And uh, so it's interesting that he's given a Greek name. Uh, that's not normal for a Jewish leader. It, I believe this is a name that was probably given to him later by the church because he came to know the Lord after his death. But this is a time when he came to Jesus and uh, we are told enough about him to give us some idea of the kind of man he was. And it's very important to know that because this purest gospel ever given with a verse that's probably better known than any other verse in the Bible, this was spoken to one man originally. And it was to this man. So what kind of man was he? And why did Jesus bring out his best guns to talk to this man? Well, it says that uh, he was a Pharisee. Well, we have to realize that a Pharisee was one who built his whole life around learning the law, learning the Torah, and learning all about the law. And uh, it says he was a ruler of the Jews, which means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the 70 elders that rule Israel. By the way, about a year ago, for the first time in, in over 1,600 years, the Sanhedrin was reinstituted in Israel, which was another prophetic sign of the times. But in this day, because there had to be a Sanhedrin before the coming of Christ. Now, the Sanhedrin ruled in all issues, both secular and religious. And they were truly the leaders. To be in the Sanhedrin, you had to be an outstanding person in every way. You had to, there were certain things that were necessary. If you were a member of the Sanhedrin, first of all, you had to pray three times a day, very specific times. And you had to devote your life to learning the Talmud, which was this voluminous collection of uh, opinions about the scripture that the great sages of the past in Israel had written. And later it became more of a verbal thing, but there was a great deal that was written down too. And so to be in the Sanhedrin, you had to learn and be familiar with the various opinions that are expressed in this interpretation of the law by the greatest rabbis of their history. Now, this would be kind of like today, you know, like when a lawyer goes in the law court, uh, he will 
he will make a legal point and establish it by a precedent from a case in the past. Well, that's the way most of the, well, that's the way the rabbis, and especially in the uh, Sanhedrin, that's the way they would teach. They would teach by quoting, uh, you know, such and such, this passage means this according to, and then they would quote a number of uh, sources from the recognized sages in the rabbinical school of the past. That's why when Jesus came and he taught, he didn't quote anybody. He didn't say, you know, I say this on the authority of Schmatz. <laughs> he, just caught, he just taught it clearly and right down the gun barrel. And on his own authority, he spoke with authority. That's the reason they said, how could this man speak with such authority, having never learned? Having never been t trained? Well, that's probably the reason he could speak, because he hadn't been brainwashed. But... Uh, a Pharisee was familiar with all of this, and and whatever was the results, it does reflect one thing. They were brilliant men. They were brilliant, and uh, they were experts at debate. They were experts of the Talmud. And, most important, to be in the Sanhedrin, you had to memorize the Hebrew Old Testament. That's the most important thing to understand at why Jesus says things in this passage and particularly the way he says them. Because he was speaking to a person who at his fingertips knew the whole Old Testament. So he could refer to something and know that he knew the whole background of it. That's important. Now, it says, this man came to him, Jesus, by night. Now, it's uh, clear that uh, by this time he would come by night because he did not want to be censored by the rest of the Sanhedrin. By this time, the Sanhedrin had already developed a negative opinion toward Jesus. They already were branding him as a false prophet and that his claims were false. So the majority of the Sanhedrin had already rejected Jesus. But this was a man who was a much like Gamaliel, one of his contemporaries. He was a man that was a free thinker, thought on his own, and he weighed things on their own merits and not just by what others said. And so it says he comes to him by night because he wanted a good audience with him. And uh, so it says that uh, he said to him, Rabbi, we know. Now notice, we. There were others. We know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You see, the the Pharisees recognized that if a man was truly working miracles, then only God could be working those through him. And so he had put that together. He had witnessed for himself the miraculous signs that Jesus was doing. Once again, the word Simeon is used here. Miracles that have a greater implication than the act itself. And so he, he recognized and he believed that Jesus was working true miracles that can only be from God. And so he accepted the fact that Jesus was sent by God. His big problem is, being a teacher, he could only see that Jesus was a teacher sent from God. He hadn't gone beyond that to see that he had to be much more. And uh, we can see that, you know, he's... He's starting off and he's complimenting Jesus with sincere belief about him. And it's obvious that he had come to talk with Jesus as kind of an equal about theology. And so 
I just love Jesus. <laughs> the way he answers this is something that probably no one else would do. But Jesus' first words to him rejects everything he knows, just jerks the rug right out from under him. He doesn't start off with any flattery or uh, niceties. He wasn't impolite, but very direct. He got right to the point of what this man needed. And so he says those eternal words, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, in the original Greek, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, it just explodes with, uh, with a lot more insight. First of all, he uses this expression, eon me tis, which is a third class conditional clause. Now, I'm really glad he uses that. You see, in Greek, there are four different classes of, of conditional clauses that you can use. The third class conditional clause, which is used here, means if, maybe so, maybe not. But in this case, it's used as a, a challenge for actions. So the third class conditional clause means that whatever he is, he is uh, presenting has the freedom of choice to do it. Maybe you will do this, maybe you won't. And so it shows that being born again is a matter of your personal choice. And then he says, Ganethe uh, Anathin, which means unless a man is born and it is in the aorist tense and in the passive voice. I'm giving you Greek grammar lessons, but let me tell you something. Even the parts of grammar of the Word of God are inspired. They're part of what the Holy Spirit breathed into the original manuscripts. And so it's very important. First of all, then, aorist tense means something that happens at a point of time. Unless a man is born at a point of time, not to be repeated. And then he uses the word anathan. Well, anathan does not mean again. You see, most translators translate this the way that Nicodemus saw it from a purely human physical point of view. They translate it unless a man is born again, as if it was a question of numbers of births. Anathan doesn't talk about the number of the birth. It talks about the source of the verse of the birth. Because you see, Anathan means from above. Unless a man is born from above, Sure, it's the second birth, but it must be, it's the source that's important. Unless a man is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that's the word Aiden from Harao, which uh, it was an interesting choice of words the Holy Spirit used here. So I really checked it out. And what it means here is that unless a man is born again from above, he not only can't understand the kingdom of God, he can't even perceive it. Now, for Jesus, to, for his opening statement to a great scholar, <laughs> to be that was truly amazing. It was something you would expect from only someone who had the authority of God. This absolutely shocked Nicodemus. So he replied in verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? 
You see, that proves what Jesus just said, that he can't think beyond the physical. He was thinking about a second birth whose source would be another physical birth. But Jesus had used the word alethin, which means from above. And so Jesus answers him again, and instead of softening it, he makes it tougher. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born out of the source of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Not only can he not perceive it, but he can't enter it. And, of course, there's been uh, an age-old debate about what does water mean here. Unless a man is born out of water, and it's the Greek word ek, which is the preposition that means out of the source of. Unless a person is born out of the source of water and the Spirit, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. So, does this mean baptism? Unless you're born out of the source of water baptism and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, that has been a great battle down through the church ages, I've said. But remember, Jesus has already introduced water in a spiritual sense in chapter 2. But here's where we have to reckon on the fact that Jesus is speaking to a man who knows the Old Testament by heart. And he is seeking to call up to his memory something from Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. This is talking about when the Messiah would come, after he has regathered Israel from their worldwide dispersion, and they've been reborn as a nation. After they're reborn as a nation, some point after that, the Messiah is going to do this. The physical rebirth is the the rebirth of the nation. The spiritual rebirth is what he follows it with here. And this is what it says. I'm reading from the New American Standard. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. You see, this is part of the new birth. And put a new spirit within you. That is the new birth. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So here, water is used as, as a symbol of cleansing the person. Now there's another verse that I believe plays upon this. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. It says, speaking of Jesus, so that he might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So there, water is used as the symbol of the word. And then here's a verse that is important. This is one I use as part of my phone number to call in, Titus 3.5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Here it shows that regeneration itself washes us. It's the Holy Spirit washing away our sins and renewing our minds. Now, my personal opinion is this. The word, uh, I believe it, it really is a, uh, a reflection on what Ezekiel promised in Ezekiel chapter 20, I should say 36, verse 25 and 27. And he knew that with all of the talk about the coming of the kingdom being set up, that those looking for the redemption of Israel we're thinking about these verses. And so I believe he reflects on that. 
But uh, I also believe that the word water is used in the sense of cleansing, whether it is through the word or through the Holy Spirit himself. Uh, there is a way to translate this verse that's perfectly uh, in keeping with the grammar of the verse too. And some have suggested this, and it is this. Truly, truly, I say to you in verse 5 of John 3, I say to you, unless one is born of water, even the spirit. The word chi can mean even as well as and. And so it would show that the Holy Spirit himself is the cleansing agent of this birth. But just to solidify something that I think is important, now, I really believe that if you have made a, uh, if you've made a choice and you have believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have received the gift of pardon that he died to give you. That's the point of salvation. That's the point when instantaneously the Holy Spirit gives you the new birth. He creates God's kind of life in you and puts it in you. He gives you a new spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in that new spiritual life inside of you. That's the new birth. And uh, yet, I believe, after that happens, now, if you were submerged when you were a child, forget it. That means nothing. You were dedicated. You weren't baptized. But after you have made a, uh, the decision and been born again, then I believe you should be baptized. Now, I don't believe your salvation depends on that. But I would be surprised that anyone who has been born from above by the Spirit would not want to follow the Lord's command to be baptized in water. Now, if somebody is killed before they can be baptized, you know, you're saved. No question about that. Just the way the, the two thieves on the cross hanging with Jesus. One of them repented after he saw the way Jesus responded to everything. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. The Apostle Paul said something about baptism in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, which I think puts baptism in its proper place. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. This is what he says. Now, I mean this, that each one of you who is saying, I am of Paul, I of, pa I of Apollos, I of Cephas, I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God. Now, listen to this carefully. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now, I did baptize also maybe the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, which gets people born again. Because what you're doing is giving a testimony to God above all when you're baptized. You're telling God in that divine act, that that sacrament that he commanded, you're telling God, I believe that the moment I believed in Jesus Christ, I was so put in union with him that I was put to death and buried with him in baptism. And that's when you go into the water. And I was raised with him into new life as you come out of the water. That is what you should be telling God in your heart when you're baptized. You should know that. It's a picture of believing that you're so in union with Christ that everything that happened to him is happening to you. And when you do it that way, baptism really takes on meaning. The greatest baptisms I've ever participated in took place at Berkeley during the free speech days when the communists had their banners out there and all of the 
various groups had their banners out there, and we would have a free speech thing on the steps of Sproul Hall there, and uh, people would come to Christ, and we'd take them to Ludwig's Fountain right in the middle of that and baptize them there, and it would drive everybody nuts. I miss the smell of tear gas because we had some... It caused such a furor, the police would come, tear gas would be flying and everything, and I'd turn to my buddy, Pat Matricia, and I'd say, isn't this great? <laughs> because when those people were baptized, they knew something was happening. <laughs> All right, let's go to verse 6. Now he, he goes to the source. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit, is Spirit. Here's another way of translating that. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. And so he's emphasizing to Nicodemus now, this great theologian, he's emphasizing to him, look, the source of this birth is from above by the Spirit of God himself. And he gives birth to spiritual life that is God's kind of life in you. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. You can find more of How Lindsay at his website, www.howlindsay.com. There you can access our video and article archives. Visit our online store for Hal Lindsey CDs, books, and other specialty items. The Late Great Planet Earth is a timeless examination of the Bible prophecies about the end of this age. When it was published, it caused a worldwide sensation. Now, you can own the Home Study Guide for the Late Great Planet Earth. It provides valuable assistance for the study and discussion of both the book and the Bible, suggested scriptures to study, helpful questions, relevant remarks, and vivid illustrations will help you better understand this world-changing book. Get your Late Great Planet Earth Study Guide for only $10.99 plus shipping and handling. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to How Lindsay Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit howlindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.